Well, good morning, and we are launching a brand new series today called The Grass is Always Greener. Because all of us, right, all of us, even, even, well, even you, have had a time in your life when you said, you know what, I'm really content with what I have. I'm really happy with what I have. But then you see something better. You see something bigger. You see someone in a, in a stage of life that you want. You, you see someone with a life that you want, and you go, you know what? I'm not cool with what I have. Right? I'm not cool, right? You are tempted to look over the fence and see how green their grass is. Right? See how green the grass is over there. Because, that's 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 how the saying goes, the grass is always greener on the other side. You've heard that, right? Now, my dad likes to say the grass is always greener on top of the septic tank or in the cow pasture. You know what happens there, but we're not going to talk about those two things today. You see, we talk about the grass is always greener. When we say the grass is always greener on the other side, it's because it resonates with us. Right? And it's, that, it's that thing in us, it's that thing in us that wants to see the other side and, and, and it's say that, you know what, that, that's better. That's better than what I'm currently experiencing. Always. Right? We, we say always. The grass is always greener on the other side. Always, right? Because it, it really becomes a problem for us. Now, I know many of you thinking, well, I don't always think that. And that's right. You probably don't always think that all the time. But when you're tempted and when you look over that fence, the grass always appears greener. You have the, the green grass syndrome. Now, that's a big deal here in New Mexico because it takes a lot of work to get green grass, right? We have, a, we have that New Mexico brown grass and New Mexico yellow grass. But we all have, in all, in all of us, all of us have a tendency to some degree or another to have this, this green grass syndrome. Now, what is green grass? What is green grass? Here's here's a definition that kind of puts us all on the same page. Green grass refers to the thing that we don't currently have, the thing that you don't currently have, the thing that I don't currently have, that I think, that you think, that we think will actually give me, will give you what I want most, what what, what you want most. So the green grass refers to the thing that I don't have, that if I get it, it will, it will give me what I actually want the most. That thing that, that when you see it, when you hear about it, when you, ex- when you look over the other side and you see it, you say, if I just had that, just having that will give me the life that I really want. It will give me the thing that I actually want the most. Now, sometimes it's a thing, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a car, or it's a house, it's a, you know, it's green grass, maybe literal green grass if you can't grow green grass in your, in your yard. But sometimes it's a, it's a thing, it's a, it's a job, it's a person. Sometimes it's a little more, it's, it's a little more out there, it's a, it's a situation, It's a season of life. It's a relationship dynamic that you think, oh, man, if I had that, right? Oh, if I had that, it would, if I had that thing, I think it would really, it's really what I want the most. Now, Clay Scroggins, uh, he he is a, he's a preacher. He calls this the, this green grass concept is a mind game. He says it's a mind game that all of us play. When we look over the other side of the fence and we say, you know what, I don't know for sure, but I think, right, it's a mind game. I think that those folks are happier than me. I don't know for sure, because who can know for sure, but if I had that, that thing, that person, that situation, that relationship dynamic, that job, that car, that whatever it is, if I had that, 
I would be happier. If I had that vacation, if I could travel, if I was in the phase of life where I could travel, right? And the good news is that social media cures this for us, right? No. Wrong. Social media actually exacerbates this. It makes it worse because used to, back in the old days before social media, I just had to dream about what other people had. I just had to think about what they had. But now with social media, I get to see it and it's in, in my face all the time. And in fact, there are people that get paid, influencers that get paid just to show you what you're missing by not having that thing, that product, that way of life. And so to help us, to help us, I thought it would be a good exercise for us to do just a little fill in the blank. Just a little fill in the blank. And you got to fill this in, fill this, fill this blank in, right? As soon as I get blank, as soon as I get blank, I'll have what I want. So fill it in. What is it? As soon as I have blank, I will have what I want. What is that thing for you? What is that thing? What would you put in there, right? And some of you would say, as soon as I get out of debt, I'll have what I want, right? And that's great. As soon, some of you have thought it so great that you just, you know, you said my, my main debt elimination strategy is the lottery and it's really going to pay off one day. Some of you are thinking, if I, if I, if I just, as soon as I get that thing, as soon as I get my own home, as soon as I get my own place, my own, my own place to live, right? You, maybe, you're, maybe you're sitting on the couch chilling with your parents, and you're saying, if I just had my own place, I, I, you know, I'll have the thing I want, right? And your parents are going, yes, yes, if you just had that, that would be the thing we all want, right? Like that's, and I get that, that living at home can be a tough situation. It can, be, it can be tricky, and some of you are doing it to save money, and some of you are doing it because it's been a long, weird year. Some of you are doing it for a lot of reasons, and you say, if I just had my own place, I would have what I wanted. If I just had my own car, maybe you're a teenager, and you going, man, I can drive, I have my license. If I just had my car, if I just had my own car, my own set of wheels... I'll have what I want. I'll have what I want. Some of you said, man, if I, if I had a new job, or if, you're, you're going, if my spouse had a new job, if my spouse had a new job, some of you are, are, you don't want a new job for you, you want a new job for your spouse. As soon as my spouse gets a new job, they'll have more time to spend with me and the kids, or they'll have more time, you know, they'll have some more, or as soon as my spouse gets a new job that pays better, man, she'll be able to fund my ministry habit, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's always my hope. That's always, I'll have what I want, right? Just kidding. Some of you are thinking, if I just had a spouse, I just want to be married, Right? I just want a spouse. When I have a spouse, a husband or a wife, I'll have what I want. And some of you are like, man, I am married. I have one of those. And if I just maybe didn't have one, or even a different one, I would have what I want. Right? Some of you may be thinking, as soon as I, I have kids... I really, we're, we're, we want to have kids. As soon as I have kids, I'll have what I want, right? And all the people with kids are maybe laughing a little, a little too, like, like insanely looking. Kind of that weird, that weird guy laugh. You're like, no, 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 maybe you can just hold off a little while longer, right? Right, because, because some of you are saying, you know what? If I just had kids, I'll have what I want. And there are some of you with kids going, man, if, if I just didn't have to deal with these kids all the time, then I would have what I wanted. Like if I was an empty nester. You know, you, you ever hear somebody talk about the greatest times of their life? It's always like before they had kids or, or when their kids all left. Like that's, the, that's like the greatest, funnest time of their life. And so all of us with kids at home are like, man, that sounds really, really good. I'd love to have that someday. But you see, this is how life works. This is, 
This is how this green grass concept, it's your mind playing a trick on you because I'm trying to pull the curtain back a little bit on this and show you what's underneath and show you that it's it's a big deal when you start thinking, well, if I just had that, when you start peering over the fence to the other side and going, man, that grass looks way greener. Because sometimes you think you want this thing, and, and then you really think you want it, right? You think, man, this is the thing you're going to go after. Uh, but really, that's the thing you've got to pay attention to. You've got to pay attention to it. Because what's underneath, what's underneath that mindset of the thing that you want, this, this greener grass mindset has an insatiable appetite for more and more, right? right? Uh, and, and there's this thing in us that says, no matter how green my grass gets, no matter how beautiful my yard looks, somebody's is always better, and that's what I'm always chasing. It's never going to be good enough, no matter how much money I make or no matter how close I am with my family, no matter you know, what it is that I'm searching after, no matter how good the job is, no matter how great my kids are, it's never enough. It's never enough. No matter how many vacations I take, no matter how flexible my life is or, or how just strict my life is, whatever your green grass is, it, this, this insatiable appetite for more always, always leaves us wanting. And so what is that? Well, it shows up in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's just straight up greed, right? Like, like you, you, you know how much money an account, I mean, an, uh, uh, you know how much money a greedy person wants? All of it. They don't want some of it. They don't want most of it. A greedy person wants all the money. Or, or maybe it's envy. You say, I, I want what that person has simply because they want it. Right? Or it's jealousy. Right? That you can't, you know, you're worried. It's like, oh. If they have that and I don't, right? Or, or it's lust, right? It's like, I want that thing so bad. I just want to touch it. I want it to be mine. It's idolatry. And, and you, want, you put that thing in the, in the driver's seat of your life. You, you put that thing, whatever it is, on the throne of your life and let it be king. Maybe it's materialism. Maybe it's gluttony. Right? It shows up in a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways, a lot of different forms. But at the end of the day, it always leaves us wanting more. And it usually leaves us wanting that thing that we don't have. And it's dangerous because at times it doesn't seem that wrong, right? I wish I had a better job. I could make just a little more money so I could provide for my kids. I wish I had a different schedule so that I could spend more time with my family. I wish I had a closer relationship. I wish I was married. I wish I had kids. Like, I wish, I wish, I wish, right? All those things, because then I would have what I want. And they don't seem bad, right? I mean, you're, like, you're not saying, oh, if I could just murder that guy, I would have what I want. I mean, you're not saying that. You're not, like, evil, But you have to watch out for the attitude underneath the want, underneath it. Because here are, there are some real problems with living with this mindset, this greener grass mindset. The first problem is, is it never leads you to joy. It never leads you to joy. You you never go, oh my gosh, I got this job. I found, you know, that's it. I found it. You may be happy for a while. But that appetite will never be fulfilled. You know, and eventually you have a job with extreme flexibility. And you go, man, I just, wish, I just wish I could retire at 40 and do all what I wanted, only what I wanted. Right? You know this to be true because you, you know people in your life that have been chasing something and chasing something. And, 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 and maybe the worst thing is they actually got it. They actually got it and it didn't make them happy. 
Like it never leads to actual fulfillment. It never leads to real satisfaction, to deep contentment, to joy in life, right? And two, right, so it, it, it never leads to long-lasting permanent joy. And two, it always makes you the victim. It makes me the victim. Whenever I see something, whenever I see something that you have, I think, oh, that's not fair. Why do, why do you deserve? You don't deserve that. I deserve that. Right, I become the victim. You're not better than me. Why do you have the thing that I want? I mean, even when you try, you're like, oh, good for you. Must be nice to have that job. <sighs> right, even if I don't feel that way all the time, right, it still can make me the, the victim. It can make me feel like I'm getting a raw deal because of how good you have it, because of how good you have it, right? Even if I don't have it bad, it's not as good as you. And it makes me feel bad then, and I'm the victim, right? And it makes me, it makes me, it allows me to be irresponsible and not take responsibility for my own life, right? It makes me the martyr. It makes me the victim. And maybe the worst part Maybe the worst part is it takes life from us, right? It's a thief. It's that greener grass mindset. It's lurking in your life, right? It's sneaking around going, oh, look over that fence, see what they have. That's going to make you happy. That's going to give you joy. If you just had that thing, that situation, that life, that person. But you don't have it, and so you're the victim, right? It's because they're, they, they, they got it by cheating. They got it because they were bad. You deserve that. See, that's the shadow of the green grass. The green grass always has a shadow to it, right? And that shadow is discontentment. You know, your shadow when you walk around, right? Your, you, you, your shadow always follows you. And, and whenever you are living in this green grass mindset, that, that when, you, you know, when you're always looking over the fence, you're always living in the shadow of the fence. And so in these next few minutes, what I want to do is I want to tell you a story to illustrate this. And it's a story from history, uh, the history of the nation of Israel. Right, the, it's, very, it's a very, right, it, it, runs through, it runs through parts of the Old Testament, right? You've heard us about the story of David and Goliath. But there is a sad part, you know, and that's kind of a high point. But there are some really low points in that history. Now, if you go back, you know, you go back to, Mo, to, to Exodus and you read about Moses and the, and the people of Israel are under, under, they're under, they're enslaved by the Egyptians and God miraculously delivers them and they wander around the desert for a while and Moses leads them and and eventually they get to the edge of the promised land. You know, it's like, this is going to be great, right? It's, it's, it's land flowing with milk and honey, right? I mean, and it's, it's snow cones and ice cream for everybody all the time. And they, they are so excited to take this land. And, and so Moses, he doesn't lead them in. He turns, the, he turns the leadership over to Joshua, and Joshua leads them into the promised land. And they take over this land, and, and God says, listen, you know, I am, I am your God, and not only am I your God, but I am your king. I'm your leader. But they looked around, and they said, you know what? It's not, you know, ice cream and snow cones is not enough. We want what everybody else has, too. It's not enough. We want a king. And God says, no, no, no. Do you not understand? I am your king. And here's this, here's this great thing about God is, is they said, no, you know, no offense, God, but we would rather have an imperfect, you know, sometimes terrible human being be our king than you, the almighty God. And he didn't say, well, I'm taking my ball and going home. And he, he didn't strike them all dead. He said, okay, here you go. I'll give you a king. And so they, right, he let him have a king. 
And in 1 Samuel 9.1, we, we pick up where they are, are getting their king. And it says, There was a man of Benjamin whose, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphiah, a Benjaminite, a, Benjaminite, a man of wealth. So here we have a, a wealthy man. And he had a son whose name was Saul. So Kish had a son, a wealthy man named Kish, who had a son named Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the other people. So he is a tall, good-looking man. I mean, he is literally head and shoulders above everybody else. Now, let me just tell you, even just this description is a little dangerous because it's dangerous to be defined by something external, and it's really dangerous to define yourselves in terms of everybody else. Let me tell you, it's a burden to be so handsome. I know for like 40 years that it is just a, it's just a burden. <laughs> no, but like to be, described, to be described as the most handsome person in the, in the whole country, it has to be a burden. That has to be a burden. I mean, I look at the lives of, of people that are, you know, like, you know, supermodels, right? And I don't know, I don't think that their life looks that easy. It doesn't always look that glamorous. So it looks very glamorous. It doesn't look that, that great once you get below the pictures and the fame. Right? But he, he does, he gets defined by his external appearance, which won't last, and he gets defined compared to everybody else. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous when you define yourself. When you define yourself by this, other, by this external quality, right? When, when you define yourself based on everybody else. You know, have you ever had, you ever had a, a, one of your children do something really good and another child do something really bad on the same day? <clears throat> and you're really conflicted, you're like, yes. You know, won the, won the spelling bee, got suspended. Ow, oh, right? You don't even know how to feel, right? And one, you want to, you know, one, you want to like, yeah, eat it all, you other spelling bee kids as parents. I taught my kid great. And then you're like, oh, my other kid got suspended. So maybe all those other kids that didn't get suspended, or, right? And so you just uh, you allow that to get inside of you and eat at you. See, it doesn't create anything healthy when we base who we are, when we define ourselves based on external things and, 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 and when we can, how other people are doing. You've got to run your race. You've got to play your game. You, you've, you know, you've got to mind, you know, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, and if we could talk to Saul, right, wouldn't you love to be able to say to Saul, like, hey, man, God created the way you are. You are a, a beautiful man and extremely tall. You know, you, you will be a star basketball player in, in all the commercials. But, man, you need to do you, right? Like, be you. Be how God created you and don't worry about everybody else. But that got inside of him and it messed him up. And just a couple of chapters later, we, you read about the story of David and Goliath. And, 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 and Goliath is this huge man, even taller than, than, than Saul. And he is this huge man that is just destroying the Israelites. And he's taunting them. He's smack-talking them. He's taunting them because like, he's a bully. And David, who is this little, not really handsome not really, he's definitely not tall, he's very short, kind of the runt of the litter, takes out Goliath. Not Saul, the tall, handsome, you know, manly man, but this little short kid takes out Goliath. Right? And, and you would think Saul would be happy. You would think Saul would be happy. Man, one of my soldiers just took out, you know, one of my little guys just took out the best, the best that the other guys had to offer. Because, right, he's the one in charge. 
He's got everything under his care. But, but then something happens, and in, and in 1 Samuel 18, 6, it says, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the, the, the Philistine that is Goliath, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines and songs of joy and musical instruments, and the women sang to one another as they celebrated. And here's the, here's the gist of the song. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now, I don't think that's going to be a top 10 hit. But it says in verse 8, it made Saul very angry and it saying, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And it says, and Saul eyed David from that day on, right? He asks a very dumb, uh, he gets mad. He gets mad, right? Because some ladies are singing a song, right? They, 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 they can't take him out as king. They, they, they're not going to get rid of him as ruler. They are singing a song and he gets so mad. And he's like, how dare they? How dare they? And he asks the wrong question. He says, what left is there for David except to take the kingdom? He's going to try to overthrow me because of what, what these women, these, this song these women are singing. And David, I mean, David isn't even trying, right? He's not trying to do anything. He's, he's fighting for his king. He's making his job easier. But what, what Saul did was he stepped on, he stepped in, and, and, and peered over the fence and it looked like the grass was greener on David's side. And it says from that day on, he had to keep his eye on him. He was so busy watching him. He, you ever try to multitask? You ever try to, to talk to somebody while you're typing a text? How's that work out? Not good. He was always trying to watch David, and it's really hard to do all the rest of the things a king should be doing when you always have one eye on David. Because he had this, this, this green grass mindset that it mattered what everybody else said. It mattered what everybody else thought. It mattered, it mattered, because, and, it, and it mattered because, oh, David's grass is so much greener than mine. Now, Saul has a bad, right, a bad, a bad reputation in history and, and in, the, in the Old Testament. But what if Saul had decided, you know what, why does this bother me so much? What if Saul would have sat down with his therapist and said, you know what, I, I just can't get the song out of my head. David, 10,000 people he's killed, and I've, you know, I've only killed 1,000. I've killed way more than David. Right? I mean, if he would have sat down, he's like, well, I don't understand, but this song is just kind of tearing me up. I, I've got to get out of, and then I think his therapist would have said, hey, right? His, his, his life coach, his best friend would have said, hey, man, who cares? You're the king, right? You can do whatever you want with David. He's your, he serves, he serves you, doesn't he? Well, why don't you celebrate that he won the war for you? And what if Saul would have said, you know what, you're right, man, David, way to go. That is so great that you're a little pipsqueak and you killed this giant. You've made my job easier and I want to say thanks. So now I can, I can rule this country better and I don't have to worry about that giant. And I'm going to take care of you. Here you go, man. I'm going to set you up and you're going to lead people and you're going to serve me well. It's going to be awesome for you, and in turn, you're going to make my life much easier. But that's not what he did. He didn't celebrate. Instead, he said, I'm going to keep my eye on you. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> and the next day, it says, the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within the house while David was playing the, the lyre. And as he did day by day, Saul had a, as he did day by day. Now, now David, Saul was tormented. He had a, a hard time. He was tormented. And, and, and David would come and play a little harp solo, right? And it, would, it would calm Saul down. And now he's having one of his fits and David is playing like he's done. Again, he's serving him. 
David is serving him. He's not trying to take over the kingdom. He's not trying to do any of that. He is serving him. And Saul is having a fit, and he's calming, you know, he's getting calmed down, and he has a spear in his hand, and it says in verse 11 that Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. Now, he's not, not talking about his clothes. He's talking about a spear through the chest. It says, but David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but he had departed from Saul. You see, God God doesn't honor that kind of pride and arrogance. See, David David now has the, the, the Lord is with David. And the Lord experienced this, and he went on to be king. And guess what? David had everything he could ever want. He had it all, right? And not only that, but he had a cautionary tale from the guy that preceded him. But it didn't keep him from looking over the fence to looking at the greener grass. In 2 Samuel 11, it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So when, when kings are supposed to go out and go to war, David sent his people to go do it, but he stayed at home. It happened, in verse 2, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and that the woman was very beautiful. So he is not where he's supposed to be. He is going out and he is just kind of doing nothing, right? He Idle time. And he's looking out at everything that he has and he sees a lady on, on, in, on her roof bathing. And he says, ah, who was that? Who was that beautiful lady in verse 3? David sent it and inquired about that woman. And he said, and one said, is, is it not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now David could have stopped and responded, oh, that's Uriah's wife? Man, good for him. What a catch. What a catch, right, man? I, I can't. I, when did he get married? I didn't know he got married. I, I can't believe I didn't get an invitation. That rascal. I saw the pictures on Facebook, though. Great. Good for him. Good for him. And he could have just went on his way. He could have went on his way. And we would have ended up knowing so much of this. What this amazing king had done. Right, David, he had, he, had, he had evaded a king that had this green grass mindset. And we could have said, you know what, Here, here's how you do it. Here's how you avoid that green grass mindset. But he didn't. It cost him the life of one of his sons. And it, costed, it, it tainted his legacy and it tormented his family because he eventually said, hey, go and get her and bring her to me, right? I've, I've got to have her. And it costed him the life of one of his friends when he sent Uriah. After impregnating Bathsheba, he sends Uriah to die. And then the son that, he, that, that, that Bathsheba gives birth to eventually dies as well. And you think, David, you know how this plays out. You know how this plays out, right? You are living, you, you know that the, the shadow, this green grass mindset casts. Let me tell you, it can happen to Saul and it, Saul and it did. And it can happen to David, right? Who saw what Saul went through and it happened to David. And it can happen to you and it can happen to me. And I believe that there are some lessons that we need to learn Right? There are some lessons that we can learn, right? Because there are three options about how this can play out. Right? You are, right? Because you would think David would have learned from Saul, like, I'm not going to make that mistake. But he didn't. There are three. Uh, when you have a green grass mindset, there are some things. There are the, I think there are really three ways that it can play out. One is that you can chase what you are looking for until the day you die. 
Right? You can chase and chase and chase and chase and never get what you're chasing. Right? Have you ever, have you ever read a biography or, or seen a movie or, or heard of a story that, that wanted something so badly? Something, I mean, the, and, 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 and no matter what it was, right? whether they were chasing money or fame or fortune or power or a good time or the perfect relationship, they chased and they chased and they chased. And it was never enough money. It was never enough stuff. It was never enough, you know, the relationship was never quite enough, right? It was never enough. And they died chasing it. That's, I mean, that's pitiful. But maybe one that's maybe worse is the second option, right? So you can chase it and never get it. But the second option, I think, is kind of worse is that you chase it and you get it. You chase it and you get it and you find out it doesn't fulfill me. How disheartening, right? Right, so, you, you, you know, you, Some of you wanted so bad this certain job and you got it and you're like, oh, I hate it. Or you wanted, you know, you wanted, you you know, you chased after that person, right? Or, you know, I wanted to be married or I wanted to have kids or I wanted to live here or do that. And you got it and you're like, oh, what have I done? Right? Because the same negative emotion, the same kind of desperation that drove you to to, to those things are are the same emotions uh, that, that are present that keep you from enjoying it. And you realize maybe, maybe those things were never enough. Maybe those things were never meant to give me what I really wanted. Watch this video with me real quick. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and, and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean... Maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. That's Tom Brady. Tom Brady, right? Now, now that's a young 27-year-old Tom Brady with three Super Bowl rings saying, I've won these Super Bowls. I got what I always wanted. It was never enough. I wonder if he's still saying that. I wonder if he's still saying that 16 years later. But I want to give you a third way. A third way that you can that you can third way that you can approach this is you can learn from it, right? You, you know, you can chase your whole life and, and never get it, or you can chase and get it and find out it didn't fulfill you, or there's another way, and you can, that means, and that, that, that way is that you can learn from this. And this is the point where you go like, oh, you know, I assumed you're going to say this, right? I, this is what he's going to tell us to, to just be okay with what we have, right? And I am going to tell you to be content with whatever you have, to quit looking over that fence. Now, don't just ask me, right? Don't don't just take it from me. Go and talk to somebody who's like 60, 70, 80, 90 years old uh, or, you know, older that has lived a life that is full of satisfaction and ask them what they think. I think that you, you should learn to trust and be content in your heavenly Father. And let me tell you, you can learn that. That doesn't come naturally to me, and it may not come naturally to you. It's a pretty good chance it doesn't come naturally to any of us. But you and I, you see, we can learn to trust our heavenly Father to be content. We can learn that in following Him, we really find what we're looking for. You see, because I, I, I don't believe that, the, that, that greener grass doesn't exist. I do. I believe that greener grass exists. I believe every one of us 
has the, has, there is something out there that will be an upgrade of satisfaction to your life and my life. I believe that for you. I believe that for me. But I believe that, that this, this upgrade, this, this, this greener grass, right? whatever, whether it's, whatever it is, only lies in following our Heavenly Father. It only lies in heaven. You, the, the only way that you can get there, you can't get there by climbing the fence to your neighbor's grass. You can't get there by, by peering over and looking and saying, oh, their life is so great. If I had what they have, my life will be better. The only way that you get to greener grass, the only way that you find deep contentment, that you find long-lasting joy, is by letting your Father in heaven lead you there. And you've got to learn to do that. See, why do I believe that that can happen? Well, for one, I've experienced in my own life. But not just me. A lot of people have. And I've, I've had the, 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 the fortune, the great fortune of having mentors that have told me the same thing. But we can also see from another believer named Paul, the Apostle Paul. In Philippians 4.10, in Philippians 4.10, 4, he, is, he is talking to a church that is, is going to help him out in a real tangible way. And he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have re- revived your concern for me, that you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. He says, you're going to help me out. You're going to help me out. And it's not that you didn't care about me before, but you didn't have any way to help. But now you have a way to help and you're going to help me. He says, not now in verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And he says, I've learned it. He didn't say, oh, I, I found it. It just comes natural to me. He didn't say that, you know, I mean, he says, I learned something. I learned this thing. That whatever situation I am in, to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to, be, how to, how to abound. He says, I know how to be content in, in poverty, and I know how to be content in riches. And that's saying something. Because being a pastor, I've got to see a lot of folks. I've seen a lot of really unhappy poor people, and I've seen a lot of really unhappy rich people. I've also seen really happy poor people and really happy rich people. And, most, and what I've found is it has nothing to do with the amount of dollars in your bank account. Your, the, 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 the size of your, of, 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 of your, of your money He goes on and says, in, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He says, I, I learned a secret. I learned a secret that not everybody has. But here's the secret. In verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, my favorite... My, <laughs> This is a a verse used all the time, right? One of my favorite takes on it uh, says, I can do all things in a verse taken out of context. A lot of people use this for some weird stuff. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. You know know what that doesn't mean? That doesn't mean if I just believe in Jesus, I'm going to be able to dunk a basketball. Those days are long gone. I'll be able to walk on water. I'll be able to fly without a... You know, without some kind of external contraption. It, he, Paul is saying this. You, here is, you, you want to know what's, what's harder than flying? You want to know what's harder than walking on water? You want to know what's harder than, than dunking a basketball when you're not built for it? Being content, no matter what your circumstance. You want to know what's harder <laughs> then all those things is being content whether you're rich or you're poor. Being content whether you are, when you're facing hunger or you have abundance, right? When you, when you know that, like being content in in, in all those situations is harder than anything else. Paul is saying, and I know how to do that. 
Because I don't do it because I'm special. I don't do it because I'm great. I don't do it because I'm tough. I don't do it because I'm better than anybody else. I do it because I do it in the strength of Jesus Christ. I am content. I am content because Jesus Christ gives me the strength to be content. And I believe that's possible for you. Right? Saul missed it. David missed it. David missed it. I mean, David wrote Psalm 23. He says, he wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. (laughs) Unless it's that girl on the rooftop. See, how could David, who wrote those words, miss it? But you can learn it. You can learn it. You can get it. You can trust your heavenly Father, and He will lead you. Just like in Psalm 23, He will lead you to greener pastures. He will lead you to where the grass is greener for you, where you can find true contentment and true joy. But you have to follow Him where He leads you. You have to learn it. So I know just for me, right, I don't want to waste my life staring over the fence looking at anybody else's life. And I, don't want, the, I, I, want, I want you the same thing for you. I don't want you to waste any more of your time or any more of your life peering over the fence, looking at what seems to be greener grass. Wishing, oh, if I, you know, if I only had that, that would give me what I want. But instead, would you trust your Heavenly Father? Would you let Him empower you? Would you rely on the, on the strength of Christ, right? The, the one who gives you strength to be content no matter where you're at, to, to grow wherever you're planted, to thrive in whatever your situation is, and allow God to lead you to those greener pastures. He wants to lead you to them, but you've got to trust Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you give us so many examples of things that are so common to us, things that are so common to the human condition of always wanting greener grass, always thinking we can find it in places that we know, even though we think, right, we know deep down it's not going to bring me contentment. So, Father, I pray for me and I pray for for everyone that is hearing this, God, that they, that they would be led by you, that they would be empowered by your Son, Jesus Christ, to be content wherever they are at, to, to grow wherever they are planted, to do all of that through the strength of your Son, Jesus. And that through that, you would lead them to greener pastures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.